here with someone from the American Vegan Society. What's your name? My name is Vance Lemkul. Awesome. Nice to meet you, Vance. My name is Haas. And I see that you guys have um, some resources for people who are interested in going vegan. Um, do, you want to be, do you want to tell me a little bit about your organization first? I'm familiar with the Vegan Society, but this is the American one. Is it affiliated with it? Or? Yeah, so the Vegan Society was founded in England in 1944. In 1960, Jay Dinshaw founded the American Vegan Society, uh, which has been doing great work uh, since they were founded. Uh, you know, publishing the first vegan cookbook in the United States, organizing some of the first vegan conferences. They're headquartered in South Jersey. We just recently opened the first satellite office in uh, the historic district of Philadelphia. Uh, it's called the American Vegan Center, and I'm the director of the American Vegan Center. So I'm here uh, partly to just promote the American Vegan Society, but specifically to tell people if they're planning to come to Philadelphia, they should definitely check out the American Vegan Center. And if they're not planning to come to Philadelphia, they should plan to come to Philadelphia because where else are you going to go on a trip to a major U.S. city and you have a vegan center right there to explain where to find all the vegan restaurants and all the best vegan cheesesteaks and everything else. We got it at the American Vegan Center. We also do cooking classes. We do book signings. We do uh, open mic nights, trivia nights, and things for the community. We also uh, have a veg history program. We do a walking, regular walking tour, and we have uh, several uh, kind of variants that we do. So uh, there's a lot happening in Philadelphia, and I'm trying to get people excited about it. I'm trying to get you excited about it. Come it, on. It's, come it sounds exciting. Okay. Um, what would you say would be a, a tip that you would have for somebody who's kind of on the fence about um, the way they see animals in terms of like, you know, they have all these foods that they like to eat. They cert they deem certain things convenient, but they're kind of thinking about if other animals are kind of worth morally considering. Is there anything that you would try to say to somebody to get them to adopt the mindset of, you know, total animal uh, non-use? Yeah, so I've been doing a lot of that, obviously, uh, today with uh, the sign here. Um, and a lot of it really just comes down to honesty. I think that um, the uh, definition that the Vegan Society put out in the 60s, which they've stuck with since then, that, uh, you know, veganism is uh, avoiding animal exploitation as far as possible and practicable is something that really hits the nail on the head because when you say practicable, it doesn't mean practical it means something that you can put into practice and live day every day to day every day and if you can't do that it's not practicable but to get to that point of evaluating you have to be honest with yourself and so that's why I come back to the honesty question it's also a question for people who most people outside of the bounds of Vegandale right now are walking around being dishonest with yourself with, with themselves because they really do care about animals and they don't want animals to be harmed they don't want animals lives to be taken for frivolous reasons but they just figure well there's this system and I'm part of it and what can you do um, and those people need to be honest with themselves and say yeah there is something I can do and if they decide you know I can go this far I can go this that far that's it may vary according to an individual but each individual has to take responsibility for being honest about that. Yeah, I think there's a kind of uh, seduction, seductiveness to the futility of, yeah. of the whole thing. And, and people say, well, if I go vegan, all the, the meat's still going to be in the stores. And what yeah, can the I do? The futility argument, I mean, that plays a lot into the way that vegan is marginalized and kept uh, from affecting the normative concept, uh, which I thought was a r relatively recent uh, development. Uh, like after we had the word vegan, for example, but I've done a lot of research into the uh, history of animal advocacy, and there's been a lot of it going on, uh, a lot more than, again, those, <laughs> those people outside the bounds of this area that I am referring to and using them as a punching bag. Um, those people would, would be shocked to find out how, throughout history, how many people there have been who have been what we would now call vegan who have been striving toward this concept, who have been talking about these same philosophical issues because history has has been constructed in a way to prioritize the activities of dead white men and to marginalize anything that, you know, doesn't fit the picture or might threaten, you know, the nice story that they have about it. 
And in fact, when you take all this, all these other uh, elements into account of different people throughout history and different groups that have started, vegan groups that have started, you see that this has been a question since the dawn of uh, human civilization. There's been this kind of argument. Should we be doing this or not? Oh, no, it's fine. Don't worry about it. And so the don't worry about it concept has become norm because the should we be doing this concept has succeeded in being pushed to the side. Now, in the past few years, we've seen, uh, you know, work in the opposite direction. Certainly events like Vegandale are great opportunities, not just for people to come and enjoy this, but to cross pollinate, to learn from other people, and also to just be part of an experience where you're looking around and you're like, man, this is this is really happening right here. This is all a bunch of vegan stuff. And, uh, you know, it, it helps to get that, that kind of, uh, uh, that motivation to, to keep on doing it because you know it, it is a real thing rather than something that they like to tell you, oh, you're like the only vegan that's ever existed, you know? Yeah, and I like to, oh, sorry to cut you off. No, no. Sorry. I was saying, um, even outside the bounds of here, you know, when you go to the grocery store, it used to be that there was just a thin little fridge of soy yeah. milk, for example, or rice milk maybe, but yeah. now you have like oat milk, cashew milk, hemp milk, walnut milk, yeah. almond milk, you know, the consumer choices have expanded so much. Yes, but I will point out, to connect with what I just said, I will point out that silk changed the game in that framework because soy milk previously was always on the shelf where the condensed milk was in the middle of the store. Silk insisted on being right next to the cow's milk in the dairy case. And again, it's a question of having something marginalized, having something that says you don't need to think about this, and having something that's facing people as a choice. Oh, this is a choice that I could actually make right now. And beyond is impossible. They're now with, right, uh, in go. some yeah. places, they're with in the, the meat section too. Right. See, so it's a similar thing. In this case, the choice is actually going vegan. People think of it as this thing that's over in the middle of the store with all the condensed milk and all that nonsense that nobody wants. It's, it's actually something right there, right in front of you. You could choose that or you could choose this. Every, you know, every time that you're considering something, you could always say, now I'm going to go vegan. If you haven't yet, maybe now's the time. All right, that wasn't the time. Well, maybe now is. So every time you get this choice, and I would like people to know that when they make that choice, they're not like stepping off a cliff into some netherworld of, you know, make-believe and pretend and all this stuff. They're stepping into a reality that many people, many human beings have fought to make possible and it's a, a it's a group of, of many people that are around now and that have been around through human human civilization some of the most important humans uh, have been striving toward that so it's something to keep in mind when you're making that choice and I hope people will yeah what would you say um, to somebody who would take you know any definition of, of veganism that they could come across whether it's the um, you know, avoid animal use as far as practicable and possible, or avoid uh, commodifying other animals, or um, to practice a uh, a deontological extension of human rights kind of perspective, um, and to to not uh, disrespect their negative rights kind of perspective. Um, in any of those perspectives, um, we could be met with this kind of like half appeal to futility and perhaps a kind of nirvana fallacy where somebody might say, well, it's practicable for you to not use a cell phone, for example, that might have something yeah. that's from animals, or um, they might assert that we're exploiting animals if we use uh, a cell phone or something right. like that. They can assert that all they want. That's why I'm saying that each person has to then take that question and ask it of themselves and be... It's a windy day in the windy city. <laughs> Um, they have to be honest with themselves and that's the trick that it's a tall order to ask human beings to be honest with themselves because especially in the society that we now have you're rewarded for not being honest with yourself so and and sometimes punished for uh, honesty but veganism does require honesty and so you can play these kind of games about oh what if this what if there was this in that and what if that happened would that would you now no longer be who you are um, I mean, that's those are games that can be played, but you know, when you're having an altercation between two people, but what it comes down to is one person who decides whether to go vegan has to be honest with themselves about what they can do and what they can't do. I have decided that 
you know, I ride a bike to work um, rather than taking a car or a bus. Well, the bike tires, just like car and bus tires, do have some animal fat in them. Um, I could theoretically walk to work wearing vegan shoes, but I have to walk from one section of the city all the way across the city to the other side, and that's not practical for me, so that would not be a practicable solution for me. Therefore, I have decided that this is a participation in animal use that I have to put up with simply because that's the way the world is now constructed. Obviously, like any vegan who makes any compromise like that, I'm working toward a day and hoping for a day where once we get animal agribusiness out of the picture, all of the ancillary uses that are downstream from that are eliminated. That hasn't happened yet. So I do have to live in this world. I have to get to work. I have to do certain things. So I do make uh, some compromises, but I make them consciously and I make them honestly about what I feel that I can or I can't, uh, you know, make have as part of my daily routine. Certainly, I could walk to work one day. That that would be a great fun thing to do once, but it's not something that I would be able to do every day. Yeah, I think um, ultimately we do have to draw a line somewhere. Yeah. Um, and I think the same logic can be applied to things like uh, crop-related deaths. Um, yeah. And that's symptomatic of being in a non-vegan world. Right. You know, you can bet that if there were veganic farms as the exclusive type of farming that it would be taken into consideration how many other animals are killed either by harvesting machines or pesticides sure, yeah. and things like that. Well, I mean, and again, crop deaths is one of those uh, gotchas that uh, people like to use without even thinking about it because as we know that you know the number of plants that vegans eat versus the number of plants that need to be uh, processed for meat eaters to eat uh, it's it's ridiculous they they're causing more crop more of the things that they're talking about uh, that uh, than vegans are uh, but oh well what if we're using you know, corn and soy and you're eating actual legumes and they're have different processes you know that's getting into that whole semantic game that I was talking about before and that can be fun that on an intellectual basis but it doesn't really impact you know the seriousness of a decision to go vegan and yeah I think I think it's um, a matter of people kind of feigning compassion in a way yeah and also as you said you know neglecting the obvious fact that if they're concerned with the animals that die out in fields, etc., or yeah. monocropping, that's all the more reason to go vegan. Of course. I mean, there's much more monocropping involved in animal feed than there is in uh, making food for humans. Yeah, absolutely. But um, also, I'm just going to say the good thing about uh, my being involved in veg history uh, and being able to see like a larger picture sometimes is, when, since I mentioned gotchas, um, people love that gotcha. Oh, what about plants? Don't plants have feelings? We, you, how can you kill those hel helpless plants? Well, you must be some heartless monster. Okay. Plant rights activists, yeah. Yeah, so that's a, a great fun gotcha that is pretty easily dealt with. But um, I was amazed to find that Porphyry, the philosopher Porphyry, wrote a uh, treatise on the abstinence from animals, uh, from the flesh of animals as food, in 275 AD where he's talking about vegetarianism. He's not vegan yet. Um, he has one person asking, why aren't you vegan? And going through, well, you should be eating all these things too. And he's, he's like, yeah, yeah, I know, We're, we'll get there. So he's not even vegan. But then he says, and here's another one I get. What about plants? Don't plants have feelings? In 275 AD, wow. he's already rolling his eyes at this <laughs> cliche of what about plants. And yet, right now, while I'm telling you this, and at the time that somebody is watching this, somebody, some mediator is coming up with this and thinking, oh man, I've got the perfect gotcha. What about plants? And it's just, it keeps coming back, but it's not, uh, again, it's not something that actually touches on the heart of the issue, uh, like just being honest with what your values are and whether you believe in participating in the stealing of animals' lives, animals' bodies, uh, animals, homelands, uh, and uh, other things that you believe that your life is so important that you, you know, the equation of everything they're losing versus what you're gaining, it makes sense mathematically. For me, it doesn't make sense. So if you or if somebody else can justify that to themselves, that's fine as long as they're being honest about it. 
Yeah, I think the concern about plants is more like not actually a concern. It's more yeah. people just trying to kind of induce guilt or just trying to kind of like level the moral playing field. Right. Because you don't see those people actually out uh, protesting against people mowing their lawns. Right. Um, no. And you don't see them trying to advocate for processes that don't need for plants to be killed, no, like lab grown plants. It's entirely a gotcha. It's entirely meant as a gotcha. It has no connection to these people's own lives. They're just trying to find any way to say, if there's a problem with your argument, then there's no reason for me to reconsider my position. Yeah, and I think it's the same thing with like the, the minerals or whatever might be, or whatever animal fats or things like that might be present in something that might involve some kind of harm to yeah. animals. It's like, if, if you're not going to draw the line at absolute zero use, yeah. then I'm perfectly justified to use, exploit, abuse, dominate, subjugate in any which way. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's the thing is that they would, that gets, see, everything that you say reminds me of another thing that I want to say. <laughs> um, that reminds me of the, uh, all right, I'm going to mention that Anthony Benazze, who was the person who, I'm trying to get this to go down. Uh, the person who essentially created the entire transatlantic abolition movement uh, for the abolition of slavery. He was a vegetarian. Uh, he was also a teacher. He wrote a spelling book for kids that had things that they had to copy out in order to learn to spell that obviously were uplifting thoughts for kids. Um, in one of them, he has a thing saying, why did you kill that harmless fly? Because it's of no worth. It's worthless. Uh, is you reply, well, you know, a superior being such as God might look at you and say you're worthless, yet God has let you live, and yet he's let you live to go and kill his flock, which by doing so, you set God's work at nothing, which in that sense, it's, it's all about God and blah, blah, blah. But saying you set it at nothing, um, like ties into what you were saying, and also with this whole concept that we have of evaluating animals lives and animals worth if we say let's say a cow you know a human life my life has x amount of worth i can recognize just by looking at a cow walking across a field of grass i can tell that that has some worth that that has some worth for that cow and it's intrinsic value it's yeah. not instrumental extrinsic and value yet if i allow it to if i give it any kind of mathematical value i say oh maybe that has 40% of the amount that I would or 10% of the amount that my life has or 5% whatever however many cows have had to die for you to eat up to that point you've already gone over your mathematical limit you've already done it so what we have to do is instead pretend that those cows lives are worth absolute zero all animals any animal their life is intrinsically worth zero unless we take them into our arms and make them a companion animal. Then suddenly, magically, their lives acquire value. But without us, they don't have they don't have value. So we have to live in this. What I have said, you know, is, is a state of dishonesty. It's a state of basic cognitive dissonance where we're forcing ourselves to believe things that are nonsensical, just because it makes it easier to get along with everybody else. To, that we run into who isn't vegan. Yeah, and I've seen similar um, threads of ideas from people who have worked in slaughterhouses um, where they've said that they've had to basically uh, treat these animals like inanimate objects to just right. forget that they have feelings and you know want yeah, to live. I mean, that's the thing is that slaughterhouse work is, I mean, the question of whether or not it is the most dangerous job physically has been uh, other people like play with that, but it's definitely um, just a terrible, terrible job that nobody in their right mind would want to do. Um, and it is one that, you know, causes people a great amount of distress. Amy Fitzgerald did a study proving that when a slaughterhouse goes up in a given uh, area, that area experiences uh, a boost in the amount of crime and the amount of domestic violence. Uh, and that's, that makes sense because these slaughterhouse workers pretend that they could just go into this place, become this one, this automaton, and then come out and not be affected. But they can't not be affected. They are affected by it. We're affected by it. Society at large is affected by the fact that we have this process going on. And so it, it creeps into a lot of, uh, 
what's the tentacle? It has tentacles into a lot of uh, different areas. Just what's happening in one given moment in one slaughterhouse where one person is killing one animal. Yeah, I've so seen a, maybe the same study where they have um, controlled for uh, drug use and yeah. controlled for income and, you know, all across the board and they do see yeah. rises in domestic no, violence. Jeremy Fitzgerald, yeah. All right, Vance, well, thank you so much for great. taking the time to talk to me right. and thank you for advocating for veganism and um, it's really great to meet you and um, hopefully I'll put this up on my channel soon. Okay. It's uh, Haas Vegan, it's H-A-Z and then vegan in case you want to check it out. In case great. you ever want to get in touch cool. with me. Cool, awesome. In case I forget how to find your YouTube channel. Great, right. thank you so great. much. All right. All right. Have a great day. Right. Thanks again.